Well, hey guys, it's Russ. I'm back from my 11-day river cruise on the Rhine River through Germany, beginning in Switzerland, by the way, Basel, Switzerland, lovely city, and cruising on down to stop at about six or seven other cities on the Rhine, concluding at Amsterdam. A lot of fun, put on some weight, drank too much, ate too much, but it was a, just a lot of fun. But I'm back and here with four dad jokes for you today. I know, I know you couldn't wait for these, but here you go. Two windmills were sitting on a hill. One asks the other, do you have a favorite song? The other replies, well, all my life I have been a heavy metal fan. <laughs> all right, this one might be a little bit better. Today at the bank, an old, an old lady asked me to check her balance, so I pushed her over. Uh, well, we old people take that seriously. I got an A on my origami assignment when I turned my paper into my teacher. Get it? Okay, there'll be more coming up this weekend. But in any case, thanks for your patience. Sorry to be a little bit late with our research articles. We've got four for you today. As always, I'll post the references in the video description in case you're interested in looking them up. I also put a link to the article as well. So let's begin with our first paper, which comes to us from the journal Research on Child and Adolescent Psychopathology. And this is a study of the effects of probiotics on the symptoms of both autism spectrum disorder and ADHD. Now, as you know, there's been a great deal of interest in the gut microbiome in both of these disorders. There does appear to be a little bit more evidence that that microbiome is disruptive or abnormal in those with ASD. But lately, there's also been a few studies suggesting that that is true in ADHD as well. By the way, don't get confused by people's efforts to imply causal inferences here between the gut and the brain because it can go both ways. Moreover, there's a third explanation for both of these, and that is that the genetics of the disorders also create certain hostile environments in the gut, probably through the immune system, for certain perhaps normal bacteria. And that could create a profile of abnormal bacteria, but that profile doesn't have anything to do with influencing the brain necessarily. It and the uh, not just the genetics, the behavioral symptoms, excuse me, of both disorders can arise from the genetics alone. So there's multiple interpretations of data on the gut microbiome, but most of the articles I see are trying to interpret it from disrupted microbiome to influencing hormones and neurotransmitters in the brain, and that exacerbates or even creates the disorder. I'm not so sure about that. In any case, this is a study looking at using probiotics as a treatment. Now, the only reason I chose it is, first of all, there's not an awful lot of research on probiotics with these conditions, particularly with ADHD. And second, it's a good example of if you don't get the results that you're after, just keep churning the data set, folks, and maybe you'll find something interesting to report. So here we have a study. This one comes to us, I believe it was out of, yes, it was out of Spain. And this study looks at 38 children with ADHD, 42 children with ASD, not a bad sample size for either of these, but the problem is they then split each of the groups in half and half of them get placebo and the other half get the probiotic for 12 weeks. Now across this time, they're using parent reported symptoms. They're also using a continuous performance test. They're giving some executive function measures as well, quality of life, sleep, and so on. And then they go into the analyses. And what did they find? Nothing. They found that there were no differences between the placebo and the probiotic group in either the ADHD cases or the ASD cases. So basically no differences. Now we have to be careful here because when you take 38 children and put half of them into one group and half in another, that's a very small sample and the power of the study to detect small to moderate effects is probably very limited. 
Uh, but hey, they chose to do it. So you got to live with the results, which is that they didn't really find anything. But then they go on to do some additional analyses, which is where they stratify the groups by age. So there's a younger group and an older group. Well, now you can see that the sample sizes are getting even smaller. And they found that there was some intragroup differences when age was taken into account, but not in the overall analysis. More importantly, they then go on and analyze pretest to post-test scores within each group. And they find that the ADHD group that got probiotics improved, so did the group that got placebo. They think that the improvement was a little better in the ADHD group. By the way, they also did the same thing with the ASD group. The problem here is, is that pre to post improvements don't really mean much of anything because both groups showed it. The most important analysis was the original one that found that despite those improvements within each group, they weren't all that different, certainly not statistically significantly different. They want to go on and say that, well, maybe the probiotics help to improve hyperactivity impulsivity in the children with ASD and ADHD and their quality of life. But that's based on those subsequent analyses that probably should not have been done or we shouldn't be putting much stock in them anyway. Overall, it's a negative study. So sorry about that probiotic fans. Okay, our next study is going to be one from the Journal of Psychiatric Research. This is a study of male and female, mostly teenagers with ADHD, looking at their self ratings and comparing it to what their parents say about them. Now, this is an important issue because while you might think that everybody agrees with each other, what I found in my research more than 20 years ago, particularly with the teenagers and even in the young adults, is that people with ADHD tend to underreport their symptoms relative to what other people like their parents say about them. And so you have to take that into account when you're doing a diagnosis because if you place too much faith in the reports of the adolescent with ADHD or young adult with ADHD, you could wind up missing the diagnosis because they're under-reporting their symptoms. Now, what's important in this study is that they looked at differences between males and females. Our study wasn't able to do that all that well because the vast majority of individuals in my early follow-up studies were males. We had a small, maybe 15, 18% rate of females in the study makes it very difficult to look at sex related effects. So what did they find in the study? Well, they had a sample of about 159 teens with ADHD between 15 and 18. About a third of them were male. Hmm. Got to be careful about that. But because again, the sample size may not be uh, big enough to detect large, or excuse me, medium to small effects. Nonetheless, what they found is that when they had the teens report on their own symptoms and then compared it to what parents had to say, they found that the females rated their symptoms to be similar to those of the parent and even those of a clinician. So there were not significant differences, or put it another way, there was higher agreement between females and their parents and clinicians, whereas the males tended to significantly underreport their symptoms, much like we found in our follow-up study, and other people have found the same as well. But this study suggests that the underreporting may be more problematic in boys or male adolescents than in girls. Okay, interesting study there, probably more for you methodology heads, so to speak who are interested in such things, but it really does carry over into clinical practice where clinicians need to be very careful about what teens and young adults say about their symptoms. And as this study shows, particularly if they're male. Now, our next study up comes from the Journal of Psychopharmacology. This is an interesting study out of Duke University, and it involves a sample of individuals with ADHD and a control sample 61 with ADHD, 75 controls, none of whom had prior exposure 
to tobacco, to nicotine specifically. What the study is trying to do is to look at whether nicotine has a differential effect on those with ADHD and those with, in the control group. And to assess that, they're giving both subjective and objective measures, and they're administering three doses intranasally of nicotine in the study to both of these groups. Then afterwards, they allow them to self administer the nicotine versus a placebo, whatever they prefer to do. And then they uh, did that over subsequent two sessions. So what did they find? Interestingly, they found that nicotine increased subjective ratings of concentration and alertness for participants with ADHD, but not for the control group, suggesting that people with ADHD might be more sensitive to detecting the effects of nicotine or might even have more of an effect from the nicotine on their attention and concentration. They found that the degree to which the nicotine improved concentration predicted the subsequent greater preference for nicotine. This was more so in the ADHD than in the control group. Both groups reported some decrease in errors of omission, which is kind of an inattention measure, and a decrease in errors of commission, which is a measure of impulsivity, in response to the nicotine, but it was greater in the ADHD group. They then went on to report that the improvements in these measures were predictive of whether the individual went on to prefer to administer nicotine if they could choose to do so, what they called nicotine preference. Uh, and that was especially so in the ADHD group. The authors conclude that perceived cognitive enhancement from nicotine might serve as a mechanism for why individuals with ADHD are more prone to experiment with and go on to use nicotine more than other individuals do. So very interesting study, I thought, that you might want to know about. All right, my last study for this morning um, is going to be from the journal Medicine. This is a study out of China, and it's looking at whether or not there's a causal relationship between ADHD and atherosclerosis, whether that's coronary or heart atherosclerosis or cerebral or brain atherosclerosis. Now, this study is using several hundred thousand individuals who have all been genotyped, so they've got the genome-wide scan data. They're going to be looking at particular genes, or better yet, polymorphisms, which are changes within the genes that have been previously associated with these disorders. And they're going to use what's called Mendelian randomization, which is where they look at the relationship of ADHD to atherosclerosis, looking at the genetics of both, and then they run it in reverse and look at whether there's a causal relationship between atherosclerosis and ADHD. I'm not going to go into the details. It's a very, very technical methodology here that they're using. And what did they find when they ran these analyses forwards and backwards? They found that while there is a relationship between ADHD and atherosclerosis, it's not a causal relationship. And mainly, it's with a uh, coronary atherosclerosis rather than cerebral. So the authors conclude that the genetic predisposition to ADHD is not creating a genetic predisposition to atherosclerosis. So previous studies have found that ADHD is related to atherosclerosis. This study suggests that that relationship is not based on genetics. I suspect that it is based more on ADHD, predisposing to lifestyle choices such as less exercise, poor diet, high sugar consumption, greater use of nicotine, as we just talked about, greater use of alcohol, and a variety of other life choices that add up to an increasing risk for atherosclerosis across the lifespan. It's the life choices that explain this relationship, not the genetics 
of ADHD, in my opinion. Nonetheless, this study shows that whatever that relationship is, genetics does not seem to be explaining it. So, all right, everybody, thanks so much. And I appreciate your patience since I'm running a little late this week with these research reviews. I will certainly be on time for the research reviews for this coming weekend. And as always, live well, be well, take care, and bye for now. Thanks for joining me.